All right, we are recording. Um, if you are here, please type in presence. Hello. Um, any questions before we get started? Cool, all right. Um, I'm on a new computer. I'm going to try to change uh, the settings so we don't get the beeps anytime someone joins. Um, I don't know if I can do that real quick. Preferences? Hi again, sorry, I don't know why um, my computer just froze, I had to reboot. So, okay, I'm back. Um, all right, thanks. Okay, let me start the lecture before this thing freezes again. <laughs> Apparently this is this kind of day. Um, all right, let me get to the right section. Da, 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 da. All right, share content. And present. Here we go. Okay. Um, so uh, today we'll talk about uh, MPLS networks or uh, I guess virtual circuits. Uh, we're moving sort of away from 
the dogma that I've been teaching you guys and that uh, packet switch networks are the best way to go into places where, well, in general, they are the best way to go, but maybe we need a little bit more control over the network. And so that's where virtual circuits come back in. So we have a network from some source to some destination from <clears throat> a client to a data center, let's say, and then we have a number of routers um, which normally would do IP forwarding, but now we want to go back into the world of circuits. So um, the first thing to kind of remind ourselves of is that whenever we do want to set up a, a virtual circuit, um, there needs to be some call setup and, and teardown. So instead of just sending a packet into the network, now we need to send some control packets ahead of it to set up this flow. Um, and what this basically means is that uh, each router will maintain some per flow state instead of just having kind of per destination state, which is what uh, IP routing would do. We would just know how to get to a particular destination or a particular prefix. Now the router will maintain state for each flow. Um, and this means that it can also allocate certain resources to each flow. Make sure there's enough memory buffers for it. Uh, make sure there's enough bandwidth. For example, we're not gonna admit flows that the network just doesn't have capacity to carry. Okay. Um, so why would we why would we want to do that? Well, let's say that um, we do have some service that we need to carry. Maybe we're an ISP and we have a contract from Google that wants to connect two different data centers. Okay. And now we want to guarantee some bandwidth. Or we have a contract with a uh, mobile provider that wants to use our network as a backbone and needs to guarantee that there will be some um, uh, low enough delay for, the, for their flows to support voice traffic. <clears throat> right? It could be that we are running a data center and we need to guarantee some isolation of traffic such that traffic, let's say from CIA and traffic from China doesn't cross the same routers. Okay. Um, um, we may need to connect to different organizations, to different office, field offices, for example, and guarantee that and, and enable them to kind of connect their computers together as if this was a single network. Okay? None of these specialized cases are supported by IP routing, and so that's where NPLS comes in. <clears throat> so um, I, I already mentioned to you guys how these, how virtual circuit routing tables are formed where a cell or a packet comes in on one interface, say it comes in on interface one. And um, if it has virtual circuit ID six, we're going to forward it out interface one, um, but change its virtual circuit ID. Okay, and this can happen also in other cases. So what we're doing here is we're getting a cell or a packet coming in one direction, we're putting it in another interface and we're also changing the ID of the circuit such that the circuit is really just on link by link basis and the kind of a chain of these virtual circuits form forms an end-to-end -end circuit Does that makes sense to you guys all right any questions about this just as a setup okay cool all right so why are we talking about this now well because it's kind of related to link layer okay and mpls is this weird thing that is uh sort of sits above IP routing, but sort of behaves more like ethernet sitting below it, okay? So um, that's why it's kind of sits in this, um, in this, in this chapter. So <clears throat> the initial goal of, of MPLS, kind of before all these different specialized cases came in, was to provide high-speed forwarding. And the idea there was to have fixed length labels, okay? So, <clears throat> when a packet comes in, a router, instead of uh, filtering through all the prefixes that it has at its routing table, which can take some time, um, instead of an MPLS, could look at a fixed length label and based on that label, make a forwarding decision. And this could be implemented faster in hardware. Um, and it has let's borrow some ideas from earlier um, ATM networks, early kind of phone networks. Um, and what it could actually do is it 
the MPLS packets could still keep IP addresses in them. Right? So it was just a way to encapsulate an IP packet uh, to do kind of link style forwarding throughout the internet, just as Ethernet encapsulates an IP packet to do forwarding through hardware. Okay. So when we look at a uh, packet, okay, we had some IP payload. This would be, I don't know, our TCP header and then our data uh, payload, okay? This would be inside the IP header. And before, the IP header was inside the Ethernet header or the link layer header, okay? Now, what will happen is we will add an MPLS header in between the Ethernet header and the IP header. Okay, on, on specialized routers. And this MPLS header is really simple. We have a label, which basically gives the flow ID. Okay? We have some experimental bits that could be used. We have uh, this bit S, okay, which indicates the end of a series of labels. So it could be that MPLS is embedded inside MPLS inside another MPLS. Okay? And so when this stack ends, this would be set to zero. Okay. And this is sort of similar to uh, when we talked about IP fragmentation, right? The last fragment had a different bit set here. Okay. And then we have time to live to make sure we don't forward this MPLS packet uh, forever. Okay. So a pretty simple header. Um, the most important thing here is the label. Okay. And so we can basically take a, an IP packet that arrives at some router. We can extract the we can extract the IP packet from the Ethernet header, put the MPLS around it, and then forward that that bundle that MPLS fragment over a bunch of routers, and then take the MPLS packet off and forward the IP on, uh, kind of through normal routing. So in that sense, MPLS allows us to make these tunnels, which act. Tunnels, tunnels through a number of routers. But from the point of view of IP, those tunnels look just like a single kind of Ethernet link okay, where we get from just over one hop. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the overall idea of MPLS. Um, okay. Um, and so those IP, those MPLS headers will be forwarded through a number of routers based on these switching tables. Um, each MPLS router will have a kind of an MPLS table for MPLS packets, but also an IP forwarding tables in case it gets IP packets. Yeah, so it's kind of a dual, dual function. And then the question is when a router gets an, an arriving packet, which is which would come through Ethernet, how does it know? to process that packet as an MPLS packet versus a normal IP packet. Does it have some sort of flag that it sends with it? Yeah, great. Where is that flag? Uh, would that be in maybe in the header? Yes. Which yes. the header which header though? The MPL. Would it be in the Ethernet header? I'll yes, you know that very it's good. Yeah, yeah, okay. Exactly right. It would be in the Ethernet header, right? So the router gets an Ethernet frame and it looks into the type field of it and says, oh, what's in it? Is it MPLS? Cool. I'll forward it to the MPLS tables. Is it IP? Okay, great. Then I'll just forward it to the IP tables. Very nice. Okay. So let's look at some advantages or, or some different things that you can do with MPLS over IP. Right. So let's say that we are um, sending packets, I don't know, originating at clients connected to R6 and R5, and those packets are destined to, are sent to some destination A, which is here. Okay. So when those packets get to R4, R4, the router 4, will look into its IP forwarding table and say, okay, my shortest path to the destination of A is on this link to R2. Okay, so it will forward it to R2, R2 will forward it here, and then it will get to A. So 
eventually, even though these paths are from different destinations and there are multiple paths that could be taken, okay, those IP routers will forward both flows onto the same outgoing link over the shortest path. Okay? The IP router doesn't really know there's enough capacity on this link. Maybe it'd be better of splitting these flows onto two, dif onto two different paths. Okay? Uh, it just makes a single decision to forward it on some path closer to the destination. There's not a whole lot of flexibility there in the way we've been discussing IP forwarding. Okay? MPLS, on the other hand, could do different things. Okay? It could decide that flows from a different source will be forwarded on different paths. Okay? Um, these flows, the flow at R5 and the flow at R6 could be labeled differently. And based on those incoming labels, incoming virtual circuit IDs, this router could forward it to on different directions, right? The, the, IP, the MPLS forwarding table still has to be configured on that router, right? But once it is, then, then you can do these, these types of things, okay? Um, it could also keep track of multiple routes such that if one of them fails, it could uh, have rules to rewrite those packets to go over another path, okay? It could load balance the flows. Um, it just has more flexibility than simply forwarding data to some destination. Question, someone has a question. No one has a question. Okay, cool. So when we then consider signaling in this network, how does the MPLS router learn of stuff? Well, that's a bit complicated. So um, the IP routing happens based on um, OSPF, okay, or some other routing protocol. And then the routing signaling or basically how to establish these routes happens over RSVP TE, which is a protocol for traffic engineering, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into this course into too much about this. Um, what it basically means is that it's a protocol that's really a messaging standard that network administrators can use to install these types of forwarding tables on routers. Um, there's a lot to it for now. You guys can kind of assume that these routers can be uh, configured externally um, by network administrators and then and that they can do some signal signaling with each other as far as congestion, uh, link status, things like that. And based on that, make some kind of local decisions as well. Okay, so let's look at an example of forwarding tables in a network like this. Okay. So when a packet finally gets to R1 and needs to be forwarded to A, at this point, we would like it to be forwarded as an IP packet, okay? to come out of this router as an IP packet. Okay. So um, basically, whenever something comes in here, okay, which is, which is in label six, there is no out label, meaning that this MPLS frame coming into this router will just be stripped out and um, then data in it will be forwarded uh, out into phase zero towards A, okay? So this is kind of the IP routing table, right? This is the MPLS portion of it saying that if something comes in with label six, strip out the MPLS packets and then do IP-based forwarding. Okay? So before this, we can have a router that forwards data that comes in that comes in with um, uh, in label eight changes the label to six and forwards it out into phase zero. Okay, here we can have different flows, but if one comes in with label ten, it gets changed to label six and then forwarded out into phase one. Okay, so basically flows to A okay, will be labeled as six in both cases and then directed on interfaces to R1, where anything that comes in with label six will be stripped out of the MPLS label. Okay. And then on this router, there is some diversity of paths. So we can label a incoming packet as 10 and forward it out into phase zero to this virtual circuit, or we can label it as eight 
and forward it out into phase one, where, where it will be picked up by this router. Okay. This router now can make a maybe a load balancing choice of where it forwards the data. Okay. Um, and what you see here is there is no in label. Okay. Meaning that IP packets that are sent destined for some IP destination will be given a label and forwarded out a particular interface. Okay. Which label this if a packets for a get kind of depends on what the router wants to do. Maybe it has a priority list, maybe it rotates packets, uh, there may be some other logic, right? But as far as kind of the low level mechanics, you have a packet coming in, it is for, uh, it has no in label. So we're looking for IP packets destined for A, which means that they're gonna get some label from here and go out some interface. So when you say priority list, are you saying like they're flagged urgent or something like that? Or just, um, is there uh, like a manual? Uh, it could be, could be that they're flagged urgent. It could be that uh, we're gonna prioritize sending data through R3. Uh, it could be that um, we're gonna actually look at the source IP address as well and see, or, or the interface that it's coming in and make a decision based on that. Um, we can maybe differentiate by clients. So a particular client can start sending packets to this router on this interface. And now we know, okay, this is AT&T for San Antonio. Okay, so now we need to put this on vir this virtual path to make sure it has low enough delay. Gotcha. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this heavily because uh, MPLS is used for like probably 90% of traffic engineering in real ISP. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot that goes into it. Right. Okay. So, one other cool thing you can do, which is what what have what ISPs do, is set up um, virtual LANs uh, uh, or virtual private networks. Okay. So let's say that we have some scenario where we have two uh, two buildings, right, or a company with two offices, or uh, I don't know, a department two departments that are split between two buildings or two different cities. Um, maybe I should just convert this to like company with two offices that probably makes more sense. Okay. And so what they want to do is to have a completely private network okay, between these two offices. Okay. The way they would normally link different buildings, let's say they're on the same campus, is through an ethernet network. Okay, and that Ethernet network is kind of behind their firewall, behind their router, so it's it's private, it's secure in the sense, in a sense. Okay. And so what can be done using MPLS is this virtual LAN that might be established between buildings, okay, could be passed through a routed network or through the internet while guaranteeing the same level of privacy. Okay. So a normal, um, normal packet, right, would have an IP packet inside a uh, inside Ethernet. Okay. Now we can put MPLS on it, which is what what I talked about before. Okay. But now what we can also do is go a step further and add an Ethernet packet that corresponds to the virtual LAN. Okay. So we have the IP packet that we want to deliver. Okay. We're gonna put it inside Ethernet virtual LAN, which is normally what would happen on campus, okay? This would be the end of it, okay? But now, instead of sending that packet over physical connection, we're gonna send it to a router, which will then slap on an MPLS label, okay? And then packet will be forwarded over, you know, with the Ethernet header basically on link by link basis. So that, Packet then gets to the last router. The last router says, okay, cool. Based on the forwarding table here, I'm going to strip up the MPLS and I'm going to forward the Ethernet packet to the switch. Now the switch says, oh, cool. This looks like a normal Ethernet packet that I would get from, I don't even know where it's coming from necessarily. I'm just going to strip up the Ethernet header and do IP based routing in my local network. 
Right? So we have this kind of virtual MPLS tunnel um, through the internet that is, you know, depending what type of security and encryption you put on it, uh, potentially invisible to, to others or, or uh, uh, secure from others, secure from intrusion. Questions? This is kind of weird, right? Because we're putting, putting Ethernet inside MPLS, inside Ethernet, okay? But you can effectively think of it as we're sending a VLAN packet, an Ethernet packet from here to here. Instead of sending it on a physical connection, okay, we're creating an illusion of a connection using an MPLS tunnel. And now whatever we want to send between, instead of through a physical connection, we're sending it through the MPLS tunnel. which makes a virtual private network. Okay, uh, before we move on to data center, any questions kind of about MPLS? Um, went over pretty quickly, well, not too quickly, but um, there will be a programming assignment, which I think is probably the easiest programming assignment you guys will get, uh, which basically asks you to do routing using MPLS uh, tables. And so instead of doing IP routing, you guys will be setting up tables with uh, virtual circuits. So will that kind of use the same uh, idea that we're doing right now for programming assignment four with setting up tables with dictionaries and things like that, or is it going to be different? Yeah, it's going to be uh, closer to kind of the first the the assignment on uh, uh, HTTP on the on the data plane okay. on the data plane, right? Where you guys all just basically entered uh, routing tables. Okay. Cool. It's, it's there, it's, it's not meant to be hard, it's there to just give you guys an experience with this type of configuring this type of network. So is this something that we could maybe like in the, in the future, take this idea and create our own virtual private network? Or is this kind of the idea of creating a virtual private network here? Um, You could, but you would do it. You would do it through a, a, a different set of tools. Okay. Um, so you'll get the idea of of, of how to do it. But um, uh, if if you became a network administrator at, at an ISP, you would be able to do it. If you worked inside a data center, um, that's something that you might be working on. Um, what what happens in practice though is while large ISPs still rely on MPLS. Um, inside data centers or inside smaller networks, even Google is switching to that, even though their networks are not small, um, people are moving away from MPLS and into software-defined networks or SDNs. So um, SDNs are kind of a more sophisticated way of doing MPLS, or it's basically doing MPLS-like things without actually having an MPLS packet. Um, I'll talk about those in our, in our next lecture. So MPLS is probably what you would use if you worked inside an ISP. Um, if you worked anywhere else and you wanted to build a private network or anything like that, you, you probably would use, you would use an SDN instead. Cool, okay, thanks. Yep, okay. So, um, data center networks, um, they're kind of a funny thing because they're very structured and they connect many, many hosts. So there are these kind of mini internets that are connected together, right? Um, you can think of a, a portion of an internet as something that's connecting, I don't know, Bozeman or Montana, but you can have a data center, which actually has, uh, many, many more computers than are you know, in Bozeman or in Montana, right? So the scale is quite massive. What makes it manageable is, is the structure, right? And in fact, pretty much everything in the internet that you connect to is inside a data center. Uh, companies, you know, use cloud data centers, they rent data centers, they build their own data centers. I was talking to a, uh, a, a, a former mentor of mine who sold a bunch of startups. And what he basically does is he, runs his own data center, which whatever startup he does next allows that startup to save a whole bunch of money and have a whole bunch of tooling already installed. So, 
you know, in, initially people moved away from running their own data centers because Amazon was so convenient, but now it's becoming so easy to run your own that you can actually save a lot of money by doing that. Anyway, so they're, they're kind of a thing. Um, and the challenges that you might see in those networks are the fact that you have uh, multiple applications. Um, each of them is quite massive and they need to be isolated from each other both for privacy, security, and performance reasons. Okay. Um, you have complex traffic patterns where different data elements or different compute elements are located across different racks, and you need to create efficient flows between those racks such that there are no um, bottlenecks or you can kind of avoid bottlenecks. You can use load balancing. Uh, you also may need to move traffic around in particular ways to make uh, cooling and heating, uh, sorry, cooling those things more efficient. Um, for example, it's much easier to cool a hot rack. So people will tend to cluster jobs on a particular rack to get it to be extra hot because then it's more efficient to cool it. It's less, um, it's less um, energy consuming to do so. Okay? So you might have concerns like that. Um, so this is kind of a picture of a canonical data center, right? Just racks of computers, not that interesting. Okay. What also happens is that to build really massive data centers, you might put your machines inside a container and then think of a container as a unit of a data center. Okay. And then you can have a data center that looks like this, where instead of replacing a single computer inside a rack, whenever that breaks, someone going there and get it, getting it, you just run this container until enough of things burn out in it, and then you just replace the whole container. Okay. So it's just massive, massive scale. You need to provide enough power for these things. You need to provide enough kind of uplink connectivity for, for these things. Um, recently, I was, I was reading about kind of power problems for data centers that um, in California, they're rolling blackouts for fire reasons. And so... Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot more emphasis on local power generation for data centers, which means they need to be more power efficient. There's just a lot, a lot, a lot of engineering into this, and some of that engineering that has to happen falls on decisions that you need to make in terms of networking inside these data centers because that's ultimately what they do is process packets. So, um, when, yeah. My, oh, my apologies. I was gonna say so when say. Google or, or Amazon or something like that experiences one of those rolling blackouts in California, does that just reroute all the traffic to a different data center? A lot of these data centers have backup power, right? They need to provide uptime. Um, <clears throat> but the backup power right now might be expensive, right? It might just mean spinning up a bunch of diesel generators. And so they can mm -hmm. deal with the blackout, but it's it's expensive to run it. Some data centers are attaching fuel cells next to them. Um, they're basically building data centers that can be self-sufficient or have don't rely on the grid for power, right? Okay. Or only, or yeah, just can run perpetually on their own power generation. Uh, but yeah, the data centers don't go down. They uh, traffic might be switched off a data center. Uh, and, and reroute it. The way that happens though, is that no one ever wants to yank traffic from a data center, right? If you yanked traffic, that means you would be severing TCP connections, which means those would need to, those would need to be reestablished. So to move traffic from a data center, good question actually, what happens is that you stop assigning traffic to it and, you, and you're waiting for the old jobs to finish. Got it, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, one of the challenges these data centers will be dealing with in the next few years um, is something called data tonnage. And what that means is that, what it basically pertains to is that right now, uh, basically most of the data is generated inside data centers. Um, and this could be things like you log into Facebook and now there's a piece of data about you logging in. And so this is something, piece of data that's considered generated inside a data center. So. Uh, most of the data in the world is generated inside data centers, but that is changing. There are, you know, more edge devices, more sensors, more things basically that run outside of data center. And in a few years, 
the balance of traffic generation will start falling outside of data centers, which will kind of change the amount of data that these data centers need to ingest. Okay. Um, this also goes into what's called AI wars, which means that there'll need to be a lot more processing inside data centers to kind of deal with the volume of data that's coming in and maybe do it through streams, the stream processing, which then means that you need to set up kind of continuous flow of data through processing stages of AI. And so now you have this kind of integration where uh, your data processing is uh, either you have networking in between processing stages, so your processing kind of involves setting up a network, okay? Or you are running a network kind of inside some compute framework because you're passing data between things and kind of principles of networking will apply there as well. All right, so with that kind of big intro, let's look at what these things look like inside. <clears throat> so if you think of a data center, what is happening in there is that ultimately you have some racks of computers, okay? It doesn't matter if it's a container, if it's not a container, you will have this sort of tree, tree structure in there. So you have server racks. On connecting this, these servers would be top of rack switches, okay, which would be connected to tier two switches, tier one switches, depending how many tiers you have in this data center, okay? And eventually those would be con connected to routers, which then would be con connected to the internet. Okay? Traffic coming into the data center will initially hit a load balancer, which will decide which rack it should be directed to given some options. And that's the general, general flow uh, idea. Once the traffic goes to the load balancer and hits some rack, this may start a parallel computation, okay, or, or, or this piece of data might kind of start pieces of data coming in will reside in different racks and eventually some parallel computation is triggered. When the parallel computation is triggered, there is traffic flowing back and forth between racks. Okay, you can think of it as like MapReduce or uh, Spark or any other kind of parallel processing framework. Ultimately, there is traffic going between the blades doing or the racks doing the, the processing in parallel. So from the networking perspective, you need to deal with two types of flows. One is flows coming in from the outside or going to the outside, okay? And two is this cross-rack traffic that, uh, on which the speed of processing depends. Okay. Um, what also happens is we've seen kind of in the ethernet uh, network example is that as you get to the edge, uh, or kind of as you get from the edge to the middle of this network, you need to have uh, greater capacity of links. Okay. So you may ask yourself, well, why not just have, um, you know, why can't we just build, uh, like put, you know, one switch in here, right? Or have, or is it enough to have just a single layer of switches? Well, it turns out that there's two issues. One, a big switch approach would not have enough ports. Okay? You could build a switch with, uh, you know, I don't know, 50,000 ports on it or more. But what that would mean is that the interconnect inside the router between ports would have to be more complicated. Okay? And because it would get bigger or more complicated, it wouldn't be necessarily any faster. You would start losing the benefits of speed in that. Um, and so because of cost, because of scalability reasons, you just can't have, you can't put all of internet on one router okay? or all of data center traffic on one router. Okay, so we need to split it onto multiple routers. Well, when we do that, we have a limited number of links that can form this tree because we have a limited number of ports on each router, okay? which limits the amount of traffic we can put through the core. If the core becomes congested, Okay, this is a problem for traffic going from the outside or going to the outside, but it's a bigger problem for the cross uh, rack traffic that's doing the parallel computation. In general, we'll try to put parallel computation kind of as low as possible so that maybe only these racks are talking to each other or maybe only the racks under a tier two switch are talking to each other. But eventually this becomes impossible and so you end up having this cross-rack traffic going through the core of the data center, okay? 
Now, to support this, people came up with different interesting topologies. Okay? So you can have these topograph switches, tier two switches and tier one switches that are all interconnected together, giving kind of more variety of paths. And so it's not just a tree. Uh, there is a redundancy and there's kind of extra capacity here in the core. Okay. So people came up with different types of topologies that support traffic inside data center. Okay. One really well-known one is called the fat tree, which it's still, it's still a tree if you kind of look at it kind of from a high enough perspective. Okay. But um, the nodes in a tree are themselves composed from uh, a number of routers. Okay? So you can have hosts connected to a router, which now creates a path diversity you can forward data through here or through here to other racks. Okay? So you have one path, let's say, uh, let me draw this. Okay. We have one path that goes like this. Okay. And we can have another path. It goes like this. And they have path redundancy and kind of parallel bandwidth if you if you need it. Uh, people came up with all kinds of other topologies. One really interesting one that I talked about uh, in grad school, this was some of the papers I had to present in, in my networking class, uh, was something called B-cell. Okay? And the idea there was that instead of building kind of expensive routers with many, many switches, you could build a data center network from very inexpensive routers, which have few uh, only few connections, okay? But what you rely on is having hosts with two network cards. Okay? So you can forward traffic you know, between hosts through a local switch, okay? But if you wanna to talk to another D-cell, okay? you would follow a link between some host and some other host. Okay? And the nice thing about this topology is that it provides you what's called high bisection bandwidth, which means that any host can talk to any other host um, or, or kind of you can pair up hosts in this network and have them still use, uh, kind of get the full bandwidth of their connection. Okay? So no matter, basically, no matter how you slice this network, you get the same kind of bandwidth between the two halves. Um, so if we look at a proposal like this, okay, versus a proposal like that, what do you think are the kind of challenges in deploying a data center based on this topology versus that topology? Uh, well, I would imagine that, say if one net card went out, in one of the cells here, then it would have to reroute and figure out which way it needed to reroute. Mm -hmm. And I did have a question on the previous slide. What does the dashed line mean versus the solid line? Did I miss that? Oh, I I think it's just an example of a path. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. This one might be a little bit more redundant, but I think that the fat tree would be more efficient in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you, you would definitely. Have, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Oh, I was just gonna say you'd have more options to where like you could route things too. So if they're getting like congested or anything like that, you could uh, reroute in the fat tree as opposed to the other one. Um, you have just as much flexibility here. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. All right. I so let's see. Let's see. You want to get from here the D cell to, tree? What's that? I just see more problems that could happen with the D cell tree. Yeah, like what? Well, so like I was saying, if if one card went out, then you know you're stuck having to reroute from the switcher. Say mm -hmm. if a, a switch went out, then you know you're kind of stuck from talking to a lot of the different uh, interfaces there. I mean, it just seems overly complicated for what it needs to do. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly it certainly is complicated. <clears throat> you do have redundancy in in both right. networks. Um, 
the real advantage here is that you can build if if you were to to read this paper is uh, you can build very very large networks with very very inexpensive switches okay a switch that has four uh, ports right is something you pick up for I don't know five bucks on Amazon so this is just more of like a an economical this is an, ac an economical it. thing yeah can you share Whereas, that paper somewhere too uh, on a side note would you mind putting that on your d2l somewhere or uh sure yeah yeah okay. uh, i guess yeah. the only thing oh, i could see on, would be that note. i don't forget yeah go ahead well the only other thing i could see then is um you're just going to have so many more switches than you would in the other one that eventually like you're going to have to put them somewhere <laughs> right um, so i do feel like the physical like size of this would be bigger especially once you get like to a really large scale right so you still have the top of rack switch right in in either scenario okay the biggest problem with with this is the wires mm -hmm. look how long they are right if if this is one rack and this is another rack it doesn't mean they're going to be next to each other you can't put every rack next to every other rack Right. Eventually, you're gonna have to run a really long Ethernet cable, right? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's it's that that's gonna be a problem. Just just laying this out, maintaining that those links, right? Or even making sure you connect it correctly. Right? So it has this great scalability property, and in terms of cost, um, but it's much more difficult to to lay out. Okay. But if you were building something like this let's say inside one of those sun containers, maybe, right? Maybe that's a good idea. So I would say about, uh, when was this? Like maybe 10 years ago, people were really looking actively at these types of uh, network topologies for data centers. This was sort of a problem. I don't know how much of an active research area that is, but um, from a networking perspective, it was really fun to analyze these, these crazy topologies and what they would mean. Um, so anyway, just wanted to kind of bring it up to you guys to, to show you that. You know, this is not the only way to scale the network, right? Uh, throwing like more money at the problem isn't always the thing to do. In certain applications, you may be more creative in building networks that look something like this. I think that's it. All right, great. So next week, we're going to get into um, wireless. Fun. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, I have one more lecture. I'm skipping ahead. I have one more lecture on SDNs, and then we're going to do wireless on, on Friday. Um, any last minute questions? All right, great. Thank you guys. See you Thank in a couple days. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Have a good one.